Now he, he doesn't believe in this anymore. He's saying all frames, whether they are inertial, whether they transform by Lorentz transformation, Galilean or Lorentz, no, all frames are equally important. Any frame, if you give me a spherical coordinates or whatever, it doesn't matter. All frames are equally important. And he stressed this so much. In other words, he is looking for a coordinate-free natural laws. Natural laws that they are written in all coordinate frames in the same way. When you write down in cylindrical, spherical, when you write down in inertial, it doesn't matter. They, the equations of motion, they look the same. Okay? So this was one objective that he wanted to meet. Also, and more importantly, he wanted to account for gravity. Sometimes, the general relativity theory is called gravitational theory of relativity. So uh, let's stop here for a little bit with gravity. So uh, usually we write down our equations of motion like mass times acceleration. And we have centripetal equal the gravitational force, right? So that usually, typically this is how we write down our equations of motion. The gravity is on the right hand side, it's an external force. It's interesting here to point out the following. If you multiply m by m inverse, We don't have a coordinate free expression for this guy. No a coordinate free expression for that guy. But interestingly, we have a coordinate free expression for the sum, which is the geometric acceleration. Okay? So uh, this is our acceleration. We have the gravity on the right hand side. He made this thought of experiment. Experiment of thought. Thought experiment. So uh, this is the equivalence principle that I'm going to talk about now. Equivalence principle. It's an experiment of thought. So we have, and I talked about it in uh, 241. Yeah, this elevator, this room, huge thing, whatever, space shuttle, anything. And it's under gravitational field. You are inside as a scientist, and you're observing some phenomenon, a ball, free in the space, versus the exact same thing. But now, this guy, will, we are moving it, this is a jet, so we're moving up with an acceleration equals to g. You are the same person with the same goal and the point is you will never be able to tell the difference if you are inside you cannot tell the difference by observing any phenomena you will observe all phenomena the same if this ball is here like we are here and you just leave it it will fall down with some acceleration go and measure your velocities how it change your time do all measurements you will get some data here over there you leave the ball, the ball is stationary, it's, there's no gravity, but this guy is going up. So to you, the ball will go down with the same depth, right? Go and do all the measurements, you will have them exactly the same. You can never tell the difference. If you are in an electric field or magnetic field, you can tell the difference by having two different balls of the same mass but different charges. But here, you can never tell the difference in the presence of a gravitational field. They are indeed equivalent. There is a more, there is a deeper, you know, thought of experiment illustrating this guy, but there is no time to mention. We can discuss it offline. But the outcome of this picture is what? Is that acceleration is actually not an external force. I'm sorry, I acceleration. I mean gravity. Gravity is not an acceleration force. Gravity is just one type of acceleration. 
you can actually create a fictitious gravitational field by changing the coordinate frame. Here I'm in that coordinate frame. The coordinate frame is accelerating, I understand. You are in a coordinate frame. There is no gravitational field. If you make your coordinate frame make a transformation to a stationary coordinate frame, it's as if you created a gravitational field. So just you can create gravitational fields by changing your coordinate frame. Merely by a coordinate change. Okay? Any questions so far? According to this logic, this was not anyway, so according to this logic, we can say that a free particle, or actually a particle, under a gravitational field, it can be seen as free in some coordinate frame, right? I'm forced by gravity. Well, I can see as a free particle in another coordinate frame where there is no gravity. The frame itself is accelerating, that's fine. Okay? How do you write down the equations of motion of a free particle in a coordinate free way? How do you write it? There is no way to do it. And this is why Einstein now he delayed in 1905, special relativity, 1915, 10 years. Generativity. He didn't know about differential geometry, and his classmate Grossman was clever at differential geometry. He told them about the work of Levi Civita and Ritchie. It's this way, right? How do you write the equation of a free particle in a coordinate free way? Here is the way. So, this guy is QK double dot plus gamma IJK. Q I dot Q J dot equals zero. I J K runs from what to what? If I J K runs from one to three, these are Q of the space only, then these gammas will be zero. Okay? Now if I add one more coordinate, so <coughs> let's say what one let's say the first equation, Q1 double dot. Q1 is just x. So I have a term that's multiplying q1 squared, q2 squared, q3 squared, and the combination. And if I add one more, which is q4 squared, it will come with an additional term, right? And the same for all equations. So it gives him a room to bring this gravity force in the right-hand side to consider it as one of these gammas. In the paper, it's not clear to me that he arrived at it with this beautiful geometrical equivalence. It was for him a mathematical ramification of this right-hand side term. Oh wow, it gives me an extra term here that is proportional to Q4 squared or whatever, so I can consider the gravity as one of these gammas. Okay? We will, I'll show it now in a, in a more detail. So, any questions so far? But now we're looking for the gammas that will take care of gravity, right? How we, how, how we get gammas from this course? How we get gammas? How we get gammas? Hmm. Gammas, you get them from what? Riemannian metric. metric. So now he is looking for a Riemannian metric, GIG, right? So this is a matrix. What is the size of that matrix? 4 by 4, four right? It's, it's now 11 in the 4D space. So it's a symmetric matrix, so I have 1, 2, 3, 4 unknowns, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 unknowns. I have 10 unknowns, these are Einstein field equations, they are partial differential equations in the G's, in 10 G's, to get the G's that account for this gravity among other things, okay? This is the result of Einstein uh, field equations. Let's see how to recover, because this is uh, interesting to us. How to recover, let me take like five more minutes or something. How to recover Newtonian mechanics, Newton's equations, from this guy, so with time as one of the coordinates, yes? So Einstein is solving the inverse problem. Like he has the gammas and he wants to get the G, right? Like he's trying to solve the 
No, I was trying to find the G that take in consideration the acceleration. Yes, which is also, you know, because he's saying that he knows the gravity term when you move it. Oh. Yes, it's, it's, it's kind of, I'll show it to you here. When we recover the Newtonian mechanics, it will become a little bit clear. Okay? So, uh, Newton's equation, what's Newton's equation? It's just uh, you have a two body problem. So, you have Q double dot, right? It's just negative nabla of a potential, right? Correct? Where this potential is negative gm, say, of the sun divided by r. Correct? Any question about that? Okay. So let's see how this guy, with time as one of the coordinates, in the limit of very small speeds, will recover this guy. So to recover the mechanics here, three requirements. The, the speeds should be much smaller than speed of light, right? Second, it has to be a weak gravitational field. So the gij that we're looking for, it's just the eta ij, the Minkowski thing. One of the requirements that Einstein put at the beginning, we said, you know, he wants all frames to be equally important, want to account for gravity, and he wants to recover the special relativity in the limit. So infinitesimally, we have a flat space. The, this is a flat space, Minkowski. This guy is a flat space, right? This is a flat with the x square, y square, z square. So the, the Riemannian metric here is 1, 1, 1, negative 1, right? Or negative c squared sometimes we uh, non dimensionalize by c. So uh, we're talking about 4D things. So now the, the gravitational, the Riemannian metric is the thing that you have from before plus a small disturbance coming from gravity. Okay? Hig where Hij is less than 1, okay? The third is uh, the gravitational field is stationary. What do you mean stationary? It doesn't change with time. Your g, the little g, doesn't change with time. So partial, partial time for gij is 0, okay? And I'm uh, reminding you, this is q4, correct? So, uh, our equations of motion, q k double dot plus gamma i j k q i dot q j dot. First of all, what do you mean by dot? Previously, you're saying with respect to time, no time is one of the independent, one of the dependent, it's not independent anymore. So, okay, we're gonna have just to differentiate this is with respect to some. Vary with the trans uniformity with respect to your parameterization of the curve. Okay, say tau. Okay, so all derivatives here are with, with respect to tau. Some variable the trans uniformly, and all the four variables dependent on this tau. Your curve on the manifold, you have a parameterization. Maybe the the the, the length of the curve is a parameterization, or some interval tau. Okay, so all these derivatives are with respect to tau. Time is actually one of the things. So the first requirement, or the first property, V is less than C, it implies that all the changes of the speed, changes of the space, are less than Q4. I is 1 to 3. Prime. So the changes in the speed, the changes in the space, the speeds are much less than the speed of light. So the changes in the space, which represent the speed, are much less than the, the, the speed of light. This guy, Q4 is T, or like I said, sometimes it's C times T. Here we're, here we're considering, say, let's consider that all velocities are normalized by C. So these guys represent V divided by C, and this guy is just dT by d tau. So if you do this, let's go here and say, okay, I have Q1 prime, Q2, Q1, Q3, Q... everything is negligible with respect to Q4 prime. So this immediately gives you that we, our equation of motion for all the variables are gamma i, j, k. Now I have only Q4 prime, Q4 prime, so this is 4 squared. This is my equation of motion. We're not done yet, 4. 
that based on your name. Any questions so far? That's okay, I need to get this guy. I need to get the gamma 4kk. So gamma ijk, we know that it's one half summation, one to four, jkl, partial g, what is that? Uh, I guess i l q j j l q i i j q l and now I just need the 4 4 right so i and j are 4 okay now what do you think about this guy and that guy they are zeros because there is no change of time so this is indeed negative one half summation L one two three because if Q four will go away, J K L partial G four four partial Q L. Okay, we have uh, this guy. This is eta four four plus H four four, right? But this is the inverse. Mm -hmm. So the inverse is something like um, approximately. The G itself without the inverse is eta plus H, with H is very small. So we'll do something like an expansion here and take the first order. So this is like the inverse of eta minus H, okay, approximately. And you can go and, you know, verify it yourself. Anyway, this term will not matter. We'll see why now. So let's recall this result. So gamma 4, 4, K is negative 1 half summation. The inverse here is the inverse. Eta KL minus HKL times partial eta 44 4 plus H44 4 4 partial QL. I'm reminding you the etas are the Minkowski, ones over the diagonal and negative one at the at the last diagonal. Okay? So actually this guy are constants, they don't change with QL. So this goes away. Now we have this term which is much bigger than this guy. So, uh, I mean, these are first order variations. When I multiply first order, first order, I get second order. We're interested here in a first order solution. So, this is like a higher order term. We will neglect it. This is neglected. So, the result is negative one half summation eta kl. Partial H44 partial QL. Okay? And uh, like I said, these guys are diagonal. So this actually is equal to only when K equals L. So 